they are all precursors for asthma development or asthma genesis in the future. So, atopic dermatitis may not be a very important forerunner of asthma, whereas allergic rhinitis definitely is a forerunner of asthma. And if you take asthmatics, established asthmatics, nearly 80% of them do have evidence of allergic rhinitis. And if you take patients with allergic rhinitis, about 30 to 40% of them do have bronchial asthma. So there is a big overlap of allergic rhinitis and asthma. This is something that nobody can refute. In this context, when I see a child that comes to me with asthma, we make sure that we do some basic tests like total IgE. And if possible, we do allergy skin testing also if the child is more than three or four years old for external like aeroallergens and food allergens. And my experience over the last two decades in India, we don't see a lot of food allergies at all. What I see is mostly dust mite allergy. It's a very, very predominant. Obviously, it's called the universal allergens for the same reason. In the USA also, we saw a lot of dust mite allergy. So that's the number one cause of allergy, indoor allergies. Cockroach, mosquito allergy, and some fungal allergy. These are common things that we see. When it comes to food allergy, the most we see is allergy to crab, allergy to shrimp, and allergy to some nuts. Very rarely we see other food allergies here, at least in that southern hemisphere where I practice for the last two decades. And children who got resistant asthma, they all need a proper allergy evaluation. There's no uh, two thoughts about that because allergy is the main thing that prevents a proper asthma control, especially an allergic rhinitis, allergic rhinosinusitis are the two common things which prevent a total optimal control of asthma in children. And that is kind of a, a good for adult asthma also. We see a lot of adults also having chronic uh, sinus, which they ignore. And they also have uh, things like acid reflux, which many times they overlook as main triggers for asthma. And when we finish doing the allergy testing, we decide to immunize, or desensitize them, or start them on immunotherapy, only select patients, not all patients. Here, I'm not doing subcutaneous immunotherapy. I do sublingual immunotherapy, and I get my antigen from Dr. Vedantan from Denver, and uh, mostly it's for dust mite. We had one or two patients for cockroach, and one or two patients for mosquitoes, we desensitize, and we are very happy with the report. I guess we could discuss that at the end also. There are a few important things that we need to highlight here. There are some studies, one of the Norwegian study that says ECA, the Environment and Childhood Asthma Study, that says that if you are tested positive for some very specific allergens in the first two years, you run the risk of developing asthma after 10 years. A significant percentage of them develop asthma. So in this context, the most important allergens I have to restress is allergens to allergy to dust mite, allergy to cockroach, allergy to alternaria, allergy to some other seafood. And uh, with this kind of an intro, we will proceed with the further discussion. Is there anything that you want to address specifically or you want to just uh, go solo on this? Sitesh? Moderator. Dr. Sridharan, uh, if you could uh, just show a couple of the slides that you have uh, from the presentation, I think it would help people summarize. We have some time. You could just go through some of them okay. and uh, that will help, I think, people get a visual of what you, I think what you have said is immensely beneficial from the clinical and practical standpoint. Yeah. And I think everyone who has heard what your 20 plus years of experience in India and many more in America have brought to your 
the, the simplistic way in which you have summarized it is really immense and it kind of brings down, boils down to a few allergens and a few things and a few presentations. But I think a little bit of visual reinforcement from the slides would be very beneficial. So if you can, can please run those. The, the last minute we loaded some of the slides. Please do that right now. I'll also understand. Huh? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Show me one or two. Can we go to one or two important slides? Just give me a second. We'll get the slide down. Now, can uh, yeah. is this slide visible, sir? Mm, not yet. Uh, not not, not yet. Yeah, now, yeah. Okay, now, okay, now it is. Yeah, okay. Now, we, we were just, uh, don't change, yeah. yeah. I was just going over this, you know, like uh, food allergies in the early uh, childhood and then environmental allergies. And uh, this, particular slide tells about what are the most common triggers of uh, asthma and allergic rhinitis. We all know that uh, household pets like cats and dogs can be causing allergies. And for some, exercise-induced asthma seem to be a special feature. Even though most asthmatic exercise can be a trigger of asthma, exercise-induced asthma itself is a special class that we need to address. Dr. Shudharan, could, yeah. could you make your presentation full screen? Uh, okay. There's a little icon at the bottom that can help yeah. you make it full screen. Yeah, yeah, really. I'm having some help here. I'm not very good with computers. I have some help here. Okay, display uh, uh, full, full screen. This one, sir. Full screen for now. Is, is this better? No, they'll, they'll have to click like right, right next to the bottom part of your screen. There is a little icon next to 68%, the one that's immediately left of 68%. Next to 68%, there is an icon. Small little icon. If you click on it, it will go full screen. It will go into a presentation mode. Uh -huh. Presentation mode. Huh? Sorry, yeah? one second. Is it working as well? No. He says, he says, says no, it, says, okay, sir. Is, is it full screen yet? No, what? no. No, I'm so sorry. Uh, is it okay, sir? No. He says he, he needs to click something for a full screen. Which one? Uh, it's, at, it's at the bottom of your screen, your computer bottom screen at the screen. bottom. Okay. Where your presentation is open. Okay. Just at the bottom where it shows the percentage that is there, I think that's your screen size. Next to it, there is a small icon. Okay. That icon, if you click, it looks like a, almost like an, a glass uh -huh. or like, a, I don't know how else to describe it, but like a chalet. If you oh, click on yeah. that, it'll just go full screen the entire press. So the slides on the, on the left of your screen won't be seen anymore. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. If you that. if you can't do it, that's fine. We can proceed with the okay. way it looks right now. Okay, all right. Well, I know unnecessary delay will be there. You're not able to do that. Okay. We should know, you know, how to get it full play. He's telling in detail, but uh, you don't get it. Okay. We we'll proceed. Huh? Yeah, please yeah. proceed. Okay. So the the common triggers that we see here in the slide are the environmental allergens and whatever that we get exposed to, like the chemical fumes, industrial fumes. I mentioned already about the cockroach and other things that can be an early uh, antigenic uh, stimulation, which subsequently causes asthmatic inflammation. We go to the next slide, please. Show some of the slides. Yeah. We, we mentioned about uh, the association of allergic rhinitis and asthma. 80% uh, of the asthmatics do have allergic rhinitis and about 30-40% uh, of the um, allergic rhinitis patients do have asthma. This is a big overlap of uh, allergic uh, rhinitis and asthma. And uh, we'll go through some other slides, not necessarily all the slides, but uh, some important slides. 
Next slide. Oh, okay. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. We went through this. Next one. Next one. We have 30 slides here. Now, we mentioned about the fact that uh, there is a relationship between atopic dermatitis, subsequent development of allergic rhinitis, which uh, proceeds as an allergy march towards uh, asthma genesis. This slide says about uh, the connection between allergic rhinitis, atopy, and asthma. And uh, they have studied in that uh, epidemiology childhood asthma study a 10 year prognosis of uh, childhood allergic rhinitis which eventually became asthma. Next slide, please. Well, we, are, we want to restress the point that uh, even though we call it upper airway and lower airway, there is uh, really no clear demarcation. It's actually a single united airway. So whatever that causes problems in the upper airway tends to cause problems in the lower airway. And once the allergy triggers, show me the other slide. Once the allergy triggers hit the nose, it uh, starts initiating the chemical reaction, which actually causes the bone marrow to stimulate lots of uh, cells which are very active in allergic inflammation, especially the mast cell stimulation causes release of so many uh, chemically active substances that causes bronchial constriction, bronchoria, increased mucus secretion, and irritable bronchus. And the sinobronchial reflux, nasobronchial reflux, and the bronchonasal reflux, everything comes into act. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is hiding my view, actually. Okay. Nasal. Oh, okay, that's Sitesh. Yeah. Yes. This, this online presentation with uh, computers, I'm little. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm not too good with that. Nasal and bronchial mucus are present. Well, we talked about uh, the similarity in the mucosal epithelium and uh, stimulation of uh, nose leads to stimulation of bronchial uh, submucosal fibroblast mast cells and the release of so many chemicals that ultimately causes bronchial constriction, bronchial hyperreactivity, and uh, bronchial inflammation that eventually causes an established asthma attack. And uh, in the cytology, we see increased number of eosinophils and um, an allergenic inflammation. The neutrophils are not strikingly uh, increased. It's mostly eosinophilic inflammation. The T cells, the CD4 is increased and uh, CD68 is also increased. And um, IL-6 is increased. Platelet activating factor is increased. So many other chemical mediators are increased. In the uh, sublingual immunotherapy, what we have observed is subsequently we could actually establish that uh, the T cell induced late phase reaction is uh, significantly reduced. The rise in the IgE is kind of uh, downplayed. So there is less production of a specific IgE when they are exposed to the allergen. This is one of the effects of immunotherapy. It also decreased the action of a platelet activating factor, PAF. And most important thing is the immunotherapy does produce uh, blocking IgG antibodies, which prevents the IgE receptors binding with the antigen. Next one. These are the similarities we mentioned about uh, the columnar epithelium, pseudo-satified epithelium, and uh, the submucosa are having fibroblasts and uh, the mast cells and the lymphocytes and uh, other cells of inflammation. Next one, please. We mentioned that once the nose is uh, uh, triggered by the antigen, it leads to stimulation of the bone marrow. It also uh, stimulates the mast cells in your airway. And then that's a reflex stimulation from the bronchus back to the nose. So it is all like, uh, one next to the other one was the nasal allergies next the bronchial allergies worse and the bronchial reaction next the allergic rhinitis a persistent inflammation so we need to treat all these things simultaneously to get a better control of allergic rhinitis and also asthma next one please you sitesh you want me to go through other slides as well because uh, i don't know about that time 
limits we have. I'll leave you like 15 minutes into that meet. You um, don't have to go through in detail uh, if you just okay. want to briefly go through the summary and, you know, doesn't have to be like each slide has to be explained in okay. detail, but okay, great. we have a few minutes. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Show me some other slide. Just keep going and I'll explain a few of them. And uh, yeah, the most important, yeah, the, the most important thing, the doctors who are uh, attending to this webinar, uh, like a take home message is, uh, we can never underscore the uh, kind of a close nexus between the upper airway and the lower airway. All allergic rhinitis patients potentially run the risk of developing bronchial asthma eventually. If not every one of them, a significant percentage of them develop bronchial asthma. And all asthma patients who are on optimal inhaler treatment, but still show a poor asthma control have to be worked for the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. You could do also a nasal uh, uh, secretion for the presence of eosinophils to see if it's an eosinophilic inflammation or non-eosinophilic inflammation. And uh, accordingly, we have to treat the allergic rhinitis very, very aggressively to get better asthma control. And also, wherever possible, uh, please make a referral to an allergist. Uh, patients who have got uh, very poor asthma control need a proper allergy evaluation. The skin testing or skin testing cannot be done for some reason, like extensive atopic dermatitis, or they cannot be taken off antihistamines or any other reason, or you, they may not cooperate or something like that. I think uh, specific IgE, the blood has to be done so that we have a proper understanding of the allergy profile of every patient that we deal with. Unless we control the allergies, we cannot control the rhinitis or the asthma part of it. Next one. That slide, the concluding slide. I think that's good, Dr. Sridharan. I think our, our audiences have a, a good handle on... Okay. We we can we can move on to the next presentation. I think that the yeah, connection is one. quite obvious and clear to people uh, okay. that there are multiple ways in which that the upper and the lower airway are connected, and pathology in one place can aggravate or worsen. Pathology in the other place also can lead to onset of new onset pathology where there wasn't one before. So I think that uh, the the audiences should have a pretty good yeah. understanding by now that these two parts of the same airway, the one airway, are very intricately connected and influence uh, the ultimate outcome of management. If you miss one of them, then yeah. you can't get the other one under control either. <clears throat> I'll just make one uh, concluding sure. remark. Uh, sure. A few years back, we just uh, did a, a study uh, about 2,000 patients who had resistant asthma and uh, more than 67% of them had chronic sinus disease. We did a CT, PNS on all these 2,000 patients and 67% of them had a chronic sinus disease. And obviously, every one of them had chronic allergic rhinitis. And we felt that this is one single most important factor which prevents you from optimal asthma control. So every person who listens to this should know that they're dealing with the patient. They're not able to improve the asthma. You have to think of allergic nose, allergic sinus. And I think you are fine. After that, you have only a progress. Thank you, Sitesh. You have been very kind and you have put up with all these things because I'm not uh, too good with computers. If you give me size, you, I you did well. Time. You did well, however, you did well. So thank you, thank you very much. And I think you're your point has immense validity because there are a lot of people who um, recognize that the more talk about difficult asthma or severe asthma and all the very expensive um, biologic agents that are now available to treat asthma, we really have to remember that if the allergic rhinite is the allergic diagnosis, the allergen avoidance, all of these measures are not in place then we are unnecessarily giving the person a very expensive medicine when the therapy could have been much simpler, like a sinus rinse or you know allergen avoidance or uh, other ways that we shall hear Dr. Moitra now talk about.
in his presentation where he talks about the management of uh, the approach and the management to uh, one airway one disease uh, so dr shridharan if you can please uh, stop sharing your presentation so dr moitra can then start his yeah. presentation please yeah. i'll do that yeah proceed the open you know yes person is right now yeah are we okay now yes we are great dr soibal the stage is all yours yes yes um is it visible yeah you are very visible not yet hello uh is the is it visible not yet Mm. you are visible but not your slide okay yeah. okay now it has come yeah. through now now it's yeah. come through just have to go full okay. screen yes perfect okay all right so yeah first of all i would like to thank dr sitesh roy for inviting me to be a part of today's webinar i really thank lupin and mr rishi and His team entirely for for means for taking up this endeavor. Uh, yeah, we are actually taking up this academic uh, events in this World Allergy Week, uh, uh, which is being organized by the World Allergy Organization uh, throughout the world uh, to actually facilitate uh, more awareness and knowledge in in actual specialty of allergy. Yeah. So as uh, Dr. Sutesh Roy, he has so nicely started. of the today's topic or why we say the one airway disease concept the unified airway concept okay. we learned from him that what is actually meant by that and and from the time immemorial uh, we had been looking into for the both aspects of the airway okay. we had the knowledge of the a single airways and so the approach of management should be also the same and we recently heard about dr shridharan how he so nicely explained to us that what is the implication of of understanding this concept of the one ear disease and how it translates to the management so i would be mainly talking about the core concepts in managing one ear disease and in the next 15 to 20 minutes at the most uh, i would sail through uh, the evidences that we have in the managing then the unified airway disease concept that we managing our dynamic is an asthma so the road map is what is the common grounds we we'll just discussed a little bit about it and what is the correlation you already heard the correlation what the impact it has on the prognosis is of the what should be our approach and what evidence we have so uh, i am just reiterating the fact You know that allergic rhinitis and asthma, both upper and lower airways, uh, they are actually an anatomical and functional continuum um, on various aspects, whether it's related to uh, the air epithelium and the submucosa and also the inflammatory cells. Uh, so all this the same thing, and they also have a same immunopathological features. Uh, so like how they actually react to any environmental insult because this entire tract is actually exposed to the environment so we have this the allergy specific t helper to cell response with the ig mediator response we have this mast cells which is there beneath the epithelium because these mast cells they are epithelial cells and they are present in all of the actually interface between the environment and the tissues and masses are there they are the guardians of of our the body in these interfaces then obviously the, <clears throat> the base membrane thickening and complexes of hepatasia which is is the part of of the asthma pathology and, and we have heard that an 80% of the asthmatics have in an stated allergic rhinitis and of the 40% of the rhinitis patients they have an asthma so the poor prognosis of the allergic rhinitis and the asthma how it starts if it is like the early onset of allergic rhinitis of allergic asthma this association with the poor sensitization of both of the airways lower and upper and there is a clear association between the allergen exposure and the upper and the lower airway symptoms which leads to poor asthma control the frequent exacerbations in visits and low quality of of life 
and this leads to severe and persistent allergic rhinitis, and which is a risk factor for an uncontrolled asthma. And as we all know, because the poor asthma control, it actually translates into more future exacerbations and need of more drugs, which has its own side effect. These are the main three paradigms of, of the genome as we all have studied. So the approach is the systematic assessment of allergic rhinitis should be done in the patients with an asthma and also vice versa. We confirm the diagnosis clinically and also by some tests and we then decide upon the therapeutic strategies. Yes. So this is like, we know that the rhinitis symptoms are the watery anterior rhinolia, sneezing, nasal itch, and obstruction. And diagnostic tests we commonly do is the allergy skin prick tests or maybe the serum specific IgE and uh, in nasal endoscopy, the nasal nitric oxide and nasal challenge test, these are not done in most of the centers, but we do have the pheno, which is, is for, the, for the bronchial nitric oxide assessment. And this has an impact on the asthma, like we need to know that the risk for development of the asthma, then the risk of, of the development of difficult to control asthma, then there is the accelerated decline of the lung function over a period of time, increased is health costs, healthcare costs, and lower quality of life. And so the, the joint management of allergic rhinitis and asthma leads to better control of both the disease. That is uh, the main and, and uh, the crux of, of the management strategies that we get from the various evidences that we have so far. So when we go about for the treatment, the treatment arms are mainly three. That is one is the allergen avoidance, and second is, is the immunoallergen specific immunotherapy, and third is obviously the pharmacotherapy. In the pharmacotherapy, we have uh, the corticosteroids, which is either intradasal or the inhaled, which are the mainstay of the treatment of, of the allergic ear inflammation, be it upper or the lower. Along with that, we have, have uh, that is the long term antagonist uh, for uh, the asthma. And we have this H1 receptor antagonist antihistamines. And now we have uh, these biologics which has come into the treatment protocol. Also, if we talk about the allergen avoidance or the environmental control, this should be a cornerstone of the treatment of, of the rhinitis and asthma specifically mainly for the house dust mite allergen avoidance measures, for the pet allergies, for the indolent fungal, fungal and pollen allergies, and also the cockroach allergies. So mainly the indoor allergens. The persistence of the indoor allergens in the indoor ambient air, it, it actually facilitates the uh, progression uh, of the inflammation in the airways. And as we know, as we, we lower the allergen load to which an individual is exposed, it hastens in lowering the airway inflammation, which goes a long way in the control of the disease or the manifestation of the disease. Because until and unless the airway crosses the threshold, the minimal threshold for the symptoms, the uh, symptoms doesn't occur. So if we can lower the inflammation by lowering the allergen exposure in the indoor ambient air, it goes a long way in actually reducing the occurrence of the symptoms and improves the quality of life and reduces as actually the necessity of, of the various medications. As then we have the specific immunotherapy, the only modality, the only treatment which can actually have an impact on the course of the, of the allergic disease. As we, as we know, and Dr. Sudan has just uh, so told us that, uh, that an individual, once he or she embarks on the atopic march or the allergic march, it goes on. So there's immunological progression and it leads on to a clinical progression. Usually it starts with a skin allergy like atopic dermatitis or maybe the food allergies, which are the early members of the atopic march, and then it proceeds to either allergic rhinitis or an asthma, which are the late members of you know, the atopic march. And allergic rhinitis initial year is a forerunner of the asthma later on. So it has a long-term clinical benefits. This AIT has been shown, usually we do it for the hostess mite, for the perineal allergens and maybe some pollens. And it actually has been shown to reduce the medication use, reduce the nasal and the bronchial symptoms, reduces the exacerbations, and obviously reduces the uh, airway hyper-responsiveness. Then in the pharmacologic therapies, the mainstays I have said are the corticosteroids. 
either the intranasal or the inhaled. It, these are actually reduces the inflammation. These are pan anti-inflammatory medications and which has been shown to reduce the various uh, so the parameters of the symptom control, the symptom scores, the severity, the use of rescue medication. And in asthma, you, this airway health responsiveness is reduced, improves the lung function, and it reduces and helps in improving the quality of life. Okay, so this slide shows that this was a study and it was published in, in the Journal of Allergy in 2013. It shows that the use of the intradesal corticosteroids versus a placebo, it has in this, uh, this what we can find there, there is a famous the changes in the FP1 that is actually treating the upper airways as an impact on the lower air airway pathophysiology. So again, the intranasal steroids as changes the asthma symptom scores that is also favors the use of the intranasal steroid use in those patients who are confident in asthma and allergic rhinitis. And intranasal corticosteroid reduced the rescue medication usage as in the in, in patients who have the confident in asthma and allergic rhinitis. So we see that those who were actually been put on this intranasal corticosteroids and the inhaled corticosteroids, they had significantly did not have any nasal congestion, and they actually had no rhinorrhea, and they had no sneezing, and, and they had actually the lowest sputum eosinophils. So when we talk about the nasal symptoms, Usually the intranasal corticosteroid alone or in combination with inhaled corticosteroid have uh, the similar benefit. But when we talk about uh, uh, the lower uh, air of inflammation uh, by, uh, by say induced putum eosinophils, which is the most important and marker, the biomarker of an allergy or eosinophilic air of inflammation, though we have the sort of get markers now, what is the pheno and the blood eosinophils, but Induced with eosinophils is the best of them. So it shows that it's, it's lowest in those who are put on both the internal corticosteroids and inhaled, inhaled corticosteroids. Now we have the antihistamines. The antihistamines, they have more role in the allergic rhinitis, but use of the antihistamines with allergic rhinitis, controlling the allergic rhinitis symptoms, improve the asthma outcomes. So this administration of allergic rhinitis is with an improvement in both the nasals and the asthma symptoms and related quality of life without significant impact on lung function. So lung Function impact is not much, but the improvement in the symptoms is pretty a high with the use of the antihistamine. This was uh, published very recently in the Mexican Review of the Respiratory Medicine. And the international antihistamine administration proved high effectiveness with the fast action of onset of action and the minimal side effects. This we mainly when you talk about the second generation of antihistamines. And so when this concomitant use of the intranasal antihistamines with the intranasal corticosteroid, it was found to be superior to intranasal corticosteroid alone in improving the total nasal symptom scores. So when basically patients have a high burden of the nasal symptom scores, usually the addition of the antihistamines with INCS helps. And this slide shows that uh, this, this when what a period of course of the treatment, that is the patients with and without comorbid asthma, the allergy dynamic is visual analog scale. It actually is, is improved, or improves quite a lot but over a period of time. Okay, so, and the p-value is quite significant in these cases. So then we come to the lipophil receptor antagonist versus the H1 receptor uh, uh, antagonist. So liquid septum antagonist has been shown to be an effective treatment for allergic rhinitis and the asthma both. Although in asthma, we know it is an add-on medication, add-on to the ICS lumba. And for allergic rhinitis, it is also an add-on uh, medication uh, to the intranasal the steroids. And mainly they have proven similar benefits as the second generation antihistamines, both the frequency resveratrin and the Martin Lucas, they have the similar both the morning and the evening and total asthma symptom score reduction is a similar. And both the people who have significant reduction in the baseline morning evening scores like the coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, and maybe such very early as the day two of the onset uh, starting the medication. And you can see this is the compact study, which was shown very clearly and that the LTRA with an ICS, as, uh, that is the bolesonide with the Montelukas, there was a significant improvement and in those who asthma, allergic rhinitis, or concomitantly, there were improvement in the symptoms. 
terms in, in the, that the baseline EF uh, had significantly improved in this group. And so this was the result to support the recommendation by the AVR initiative. The unified approach aimed at treating the airway inflammation common to drug diseases is beneficial for the large proportion of asthmatics who have compromised rhinitis. The same thing is reiterated over here. Uh, and then, logics. Omelizumab has come up to be, a, to be one of the add on treatment modality for those who have the allergic uh, the asthma, allergic severe asthma in home in the IgE level, specific IgE level to to the, uh, you know, this perineal potents are quite high. And this has been shown that uh, this omalizumab has significantly improved both the asthma quality of life questionnaire and the, and the rhinitis quality of life questionnaire. And this improvement in both the AQLQ and RQLQ offered in more than 50% so, malizuma patients versus what was in passive patients. But uh, one thing important that this patient should be selected properly, and in, in whom we can actually say that uh, they are act actually having and this is, is problem of, of this allergic rhinitis is with a with a concomitant asthma. Okay. So, and uh, then when we talk about uh, the patients with the other comorbidities, in them also. Omalizumab treated with asthma rhinitis, they fared much well. So the omalizumab came into the treatment the guidelines of both the severe asthma and those who have, especially those who are within uh, concomitant rhinitis. Dupilumab is now in the pipeline. We know it is, is a blocker IL-2, IL-13 blocker. And dupilumab um, in various doses, either 200 milligrams a week, two weekly or three milligrams a three week, two weekly has been shown to reduce. Was, was the actually uh, the, uh, reduce the entire uh, uh, means the eosinophil levels, the blood eosinophil levels, the phenophenol levels, and significant reduction in the uh, exacerbation phase. So, dupilumab is one of the most important and promising uh, in, in, in biologic which is coming up. Uh, though we have the other biologic, like, that is the uh, anti eosinophil, that is the anti. Uh, Biologists biologics, that is the Mepulizumab and the Bengalizumab within the Indian market. But the most studies we have for the Malizumab and the Pilumab when we actually consider the unified airway disease approach, uh, and maybe in, in the times to come, we will have some anti IL 5 studies also so that uh, we can extend the use of the Bengal and in those cases. As of now, we don't have that evidence yet. So these are the, in short, in a nutshell, I've tried to figure out how the unified airway concepts helps us in understanding the disease biology in total uh, and how we can have a management approach which is di directed toward ways so that we can control the disease in a much better way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Soibal. Um, I think that was a very uh, crisp and succinct presentation and you've stayed well within your time. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. So we can go through some interesting topics and questions. I yeah. think your, your talk uh, raises some very interesting points in terms of the therapeutic approaches, uh, in terms of combining antihistamines, uh, to get better control of not just the allergic rhinitis, but also of the allergic asthma, if we may say it, put it that way. Uh, the use of leukotrienes, the use of uh, intranasal corticosteroids, and very interestingly, while the intranasal corticosteroids and the uh, intranasal antihistamines did well in most aspects, but for it to see a significant drop in the sputum eosinophil, as you said, mm -hmm. which means that the impact of a nasal spray in reducing lower airway inflammation is takes us to what we have known through the challenges that I was showing in the beginning where you instill the allergen in your nose and you can show the lower airways going into spasm and you can also show more inflammatory cells in the lower airway and similarly you put something in the bronchial lumen and you can show inflammatory mediators in the nose. So I think the use of these medications um, further clarifies as we have gone into the second and generation antihistamines, the non-sedating ones, the intranasal ones, uh, that there is a lot that can be done to bring what someone might think would be difficult asthma or severe asthma, or someone might think to be uh, difficult to control asthma under control by uh, 
uh, initiating uh, the evaluation of a person's potential allergies and also uh, doing the therapy for their allergies in all the ways that you mentioned. And to further highlight this point, I, I'll put through some questions to all of y'all, to both of y'all, which I think uh, whoever wishes to answer can answer. And then the other person, if they wish to add something to it, uh, can certainly take over. But there are several points that I would like to touch on. So one of them, I would say that uh, and, and to both of you, whoever wants to go first, uh, should every patient who comes in with allergic rhinitis be screened for asthma when they come into our clinics, at least when they come into uh, a specialty clinic for sure, but even if they came into uh, a pediatrician's office or into an internist's office, and, and it's more than just one episode of allergic rhinitis and it's just persistent or it's more than one episode. So should they all be screened for asthma? What are your thoughts on that? And if you do think of screening, when do you think of screening them? So yeah, Dr. Sridhar. I think it's an extremely valid question. First of all, I really have to thank you because you have highlighted whatever we both uh, talked, the nasobronchial reflex and the bronchonasal reflex. Now, people always talk about the upper airway thing causing problems in the lower airway, but very seldom we talk about Lower airway problems causing nasal problems. This is something, uh, you know, it's like an eye opener for a lot of people or a nose opener for a lot of people. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, if I see allergic rhinitis patient who has strong family history of asthma and he's got a high total IgE, he's got siblings who got asthma or other evidence of allergies. And if he's in a setup where there are a lot of potential triggers in the house, indoor allergies, I really think he needs to be screened for asthma. And when we know 40% of allergic rhinitis patients can have asthma, I think it's pretty sensible to do a screening for asthma in those patients for sure. This is my thought on that one. Yeah. Dr. Soibal, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I also agree with Dr. Sridharan totally. So I do see mainly the adult allergy and the pulmonology patients. So all the patients who have uh, the allergic rhinitis who come to me for the allergic rhinitis may be part of the other diseases. And mainly if I find the patient is having a moderate to severe persistent type of allergic rhinitis, and we find that it's being triggered by some environmental perineal allergens, so these patients needs to be screened and for other lower airway inflammatory diseases like the asthma. Because sooner we catch the disease, the better it is for the patients. We'd be able to initiate the treatment early and we would be able to halt the progression of the airway inflammation and maybe airway remodeling. So now also the, the concept is we catch it early, as early as we can. And, and, and with the patients has some minimal symptoms also that should be probed into adequately. And then we can try to figure out whether the patient has a lower air issues also. Because uh, since, and now we have the other instruments and to look into the lower airways like the oscillometry, like the impulse or the FOT. So always this patient should, history should be very adequate. We should try to probe into it. And if you find that there is some telltale signs that the patient may be having some evidence or maybe some slight cough, which, which, which is going to the chest, maybe in some seasons or the other, we have to go for the lower airway disease as well. And maybe we can, this patient's, if we can, if not oscillometry, the patient can be even given a simple peak expiratory flow meter, peak flow meter, and we can see the neural variation in the peak expiratory flow rate over the next one or two weeks by any of the means that we have, but it's essential to probe into the lower airway, uh, airway disease. So, and you know, 40 percent asthmatics can have uh, uh, an asthma. Or the other way around, it is always there when any patient comes with allergic asthma, majority will, will have some of the other symptoms of the allergic rhinitis. So that is an easier part uh, to, to, uh, to be uh, when we evaluate the patients. But for the rhinitis is essential to evaluate them for the asthma. 
So I think uh, both of you all are in agreement and I think that's what we all do in our practices also mm -hmm. uh, for the audiences. Uh, screening does not always mean that you have to do a test. As Dr. Soibal mentioned, the screening can include, and Dr. Sridharan mentioned, a series of questions asking the person about potential uh, persistence of a cough that may be present during physical exercise or after exercise, asking about seasonal changes that may bring up a cough that may take a few weeks to resolve when they start. These can all, or, or a history that they may have taken bronchodilators in the past, even if for a short period of time and responded to it. And there are clearly something called asthma screening questionnaires that mm. can be used. You don't always have to have, under ideal circumstances, you should do what is called a spirometry or a pulmonary function test, which even a child above age five can do if they're trained well. And as Dr. Soibal mentioned, below that, forced oscillometry is now available for even younger children. Um, and, and once you have a spirometry reading and the reading, I can tell you there are many patients of mine who come to my practice for moderate to severe allergic rhinitis and we screen them for the asthma and their pulmonary function tests are a real surprise, both for us and for the patients. Some of them have not given us a history that they were having a problem before we did the test. And after we do the test and we show them what is called the bronchodilator reversibility, then they come up and they say, you know what, in childhood I had this and in teenage years I had this and when I grew up I had this and now only when I come down with a viral infection, it takes me a month to recover from my cough and before you know it, it's basically asthma that never went into remission. And then we all, always have something called the exhaled nitric oxide where it is available. It can be a very sensitive test to screen for airway inflammation, eosinophilic airway inflammation, allergic airway inflammation. Uh, so I think that we have a lot of tools, uh, which you all have both already mentioned, uh, that can be used for screening our patients with allergic rhinitis to know if they have uh, asthma that may be silent or subtle or undisclosed, as I may say, by the patient. So yeah, that brings me to the next question. Yeah, please, Dr. Sridharan. No, no, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, I just want to add, you know, they talk about um, occult asthma. They also talk about poor perceptors and... Mm -hmm. We talk about minimal persistent inflammation. All these things are there. So obviously, your point is extremely well taken. There are a lot of patients who don't know they have asthma until our PFT shows they do have a reversible bronchial spasm. And then we are able to convince the patient they do really have a problem. So it is, it's a very vast problem. I don't think we can ever overstate the existence of asthma in the population and how many of them do not know they are asthmatics. Right? Yeah. Very true. Yeah. And, yeah. and in Indians, we see the Indians are really poor perceptors. Okay, right. majority. Because in Indians, even if they have subtle problems, they will come out of it, they will take it as a part of their life. Because we all are very, very tolerant of our population. We all tolerate everything. So we all are quite poor perceptors. So it's very really important. So that's what we find. I agree. They may be coughing and they're wheezing, and you ask them, How are you? And they say, I am fine. <laughs> yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I think all the points are well taken. So, I think the next question that comes up is, and this especially since you're a chest physician, Soibal, and you obviously have a very deep interest in allergy. Now, you've been with us for a while and doing a lot of work in the immunology field for even longer. Uh, do you feel that every asthmatic should undergo an allergy skin testing at least once in their lifetime? See, actually, the thing is that uh, if you ask me now, okay, so after all these years of practice, that it is a resounding yes, okay, because as what we say, the allergic asthma is the major. Uh, subtype, the major phenotype of the asthma. And in our population also, the main phenotype is an allergic asthma. Okay. So maybe we might treat the patient well with an inhaled corticosteroid with or without a nomatin beta agonist. But if we are not evaluating the patient with, uh, because of, because if there have been this trigger, like a number trigger, which is actually causing the persistence of the inflammation of the airways, maybe a cockroach or maybe a house dust mite. 
So the thing is that this, this patients, uh, because we know that at after a certain period of time, when they become well, uh, they actually become very uh, non-compliant with the treatment and they stop taking the inhalers. But what happens is that uh, the trigger, endometrial trigger is there. It is, in, it is, a, it is in the inhaling the trigger, airway inflammation is persists and it gets hastened when they are not properly taking the inhalers. And this leads on to the progression of the disease and the underlying airway remodeling. So these patients, they need an allergy evaluation at least at some point during their treatment part to see that whether they have uh, any perennial allergenic sensitization, which can be causing the or triggering the symptoms. So that's a, that is how it should be. So Dr. Point. Sarival speaking for the adult patients gives a resounding yes that at some point in their evaluation every asthma patient should be looked at from the allergic standpoint and tested whether it's done through an allergy skin test or through the uh, very widely available these days specific Ig tests or even now the component resolved diagnostic testing. Uh, it, it, it gives us some direction and as he rightly said up to 66% of uh, adult patients with asthma or maybe 65 or some may say higher 70, some may say 55, um, have allergic pathology as their primary trigger or as a major trigger. So coming to you, Dr. Sridharan, I know you raised your hand and I want you to chime in on the same question. You're seeing more children and raising a point. So please, uh, should all asthma patients at some point be evaluated for allergies? I think everything is already said, but I want to just add one point. The quality of life improves once you have done an allergy testing and you are able to find an allergy and you are able to specifically help them. The long-term cost of asthma management also comes down when you're able to do an allergy evaluation and address that point very specifically. So this way, I think allergy evaluation helps the patient to contain the cost and help the quality of life and also gives us a satisfaction that we are more holistically treating the patient rather than just giving pharma pharmacotherapy, right? True. So we are not just giving them anti-inflammatory therapy after the problem has set in into their airways, but we are preventing the problem by doing allergen avoidance and potentially, as we talk about a disease-modifying therapy, something called allergen immunotherapy. So that brings me to the next question that I want to direct to you, uh, Dr. Sridharan, uh, what has been your experience with regards to allergen immunotherapy for patients with allergic rhinitis or allergic asthma or both? And um, what is your thought, you know, because I'm sure, I think I heard you mention that you largely do sublingual immunotherapy now, uh, but I'm sure you've done subcutaneous immunotherapy in the US and you can give us some insights into your experience with using immunotherapy in patients with the one airway pathology? Great. Thank you for the question. When I practiced for about 10 years in Oklahoma City, I was in a group which was practicing pediatric allergy, pediatric associates and allergy practice. So we were doing extensively allergy evaluation and subcutaneous immunotherapy. And we were very happy with the results. Most of the time, we were desensitizing against dust mite. We were desensitizing against many pollens, many fungal. And many times, it's not just one shot, maybe like two or three different shots per group of allergens. Our results have been very, very satisfying. Very seldom we had any bad reaction like anaphylaxis. Very, very seldom. Maybe one or two I could recall. Almost like a near fatal anaphylaxis, one or two, but uh, we were able to them, but most of the time, it was a very, very safe um, subcutaneous immunotherapy, which really made the patient happy and which made us very happy about the way we were doing practice. So our experience has been extremely gratifying and very reassuring for the patients also in the last, in the 10 years that I practiced uh, in USA. In UAE, we were not uh, allowed to do immunotherapy at that time. I was taught, I'm talking about 1989 to 98 during the time. We were trying to establish an allergy evaluation process in the ministry and things like that. So we didn't have the right antigen for the subcutaneous immunotherapy. After coming back to India, 
I feel very uneasy about initiating subcutaneous immunotherapy in a lot of patients for many different reasons, including a uh, possibility of allergic uh, responses, uh, the quality of uh, extracts, and it has to be refrigerated properly and things like that. There are a lot of practical problems. I felt with all the things that we have, all the fantastic medicines that we have, we'll be able to deliver very, very good control and have a proper asthma control even without immunotherapy. But there are certain, like a subset of population which we deal with, they have terrible, terrible allergies to very specific things like dust mite, cockroach, and few things. For them, after having long discussions with Dr. Vedantan, we decided to go with SLIT. And we were very happy about that. We have several hundred patients on SLIT now over the last 20 years that I have been in practice in Chennai. And every day we do at least a couple of skin testing. We have uh, several thousand patients who had a positive uh, skin testing reaction, but not everybody is on slate. Obviously, there are criteria that we follow. And we try to start slate only for patients who are selectively show like dustmite allergy. If they have multiple allergy, then doing a slate just for immune, like uh, dust mite doesn't help a whole lot. My experience says slate definitely helps. Maybe it's not as good as subcutaneous immunotherapy, but it's very safe extremely well accepted by the patient. It's cost effective. It definitely helps us to manage the asthma and allergy much better. Allergic rain is way better. Allergic asthma, a lot better. This is my feeling. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Sridhar. And I think uh, your, your experience kind of mirrors what I experienced when I practiced for around 10 years in America and now about 12 years in India. So I think that uh, though I do still subcutaneous immunotherapy in India very much, um, I, I would like to say for the interest of the audience is that officially, or as I would say, DCGI approval is for subcutaneous immunotherapy, but sublingual immunotherapy is practiced by all those practitioners who have experience in it, who have training in it and know how to do it correctly. Um, and it is safe um, even in terms of anaphylactic reactions to subcutaneous immunotherapy, they've become extremely rare in the US also. So much so that the last 10 years review, there have been no fatalities at all from subcutaneous immunotherapy, which were known till about 10, 15 years ago in a rare case. So I think that even subcutaneous immunotherapy has become a lot safer. Sublingual has always been safer, but the efficacy, as you mentioned, was a little bit lower than subcutaneous, but then the convenience factor of being able to do it at home, not worry about serious reactions, being easier to manage if there was a reaction, all of that makes the sublingual immunotherapy very attractive. Um, Dr. Sridharan, I, I don't know if Dr. Moitra can hear us. I don't see him on the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. Rishi or Dr. Mithi, can you all just connect with him and see if he's having some connectivity issues, please? Um, but oh, but in terms of, uh, you know, the degree of improvement, would you say, Dr. Sridharan, there have been patients who have actually come off their medications once you have done immunotherapy for the recommended three to five years, as it is recommended, have they come off their uh, inhaled steroids, their nasal steroids, their anti their leukotrienes? Uh, do, you think, do you think you've seen response to that? Yes, Dr. Moitra, we can just barely hear you, but we can't see you. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some issues I'm having. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can yeah, hear you loud and clear. We just can't see you. You've you've taken on the invisibility cloak for us. Invisible I think you force. must have been watching a oh, bit too much Harry Potter. Well, I, uh, I know you are invisible. I don't know. I know you are invisible. <laughs> no, means, uh, means, am I am I visible? No, we can hear you loud and clear, but we can't see you. Your video is not coming through. Just see if your uh, video is turned off. We may have to just turn it on because the voice is coming clear. Uh, okay. Yes, please. You I think very... some, uh, am, I, am I visible right now? No, Person. just audible. But but even audible. if you're audible, so well, I think it's okay because we are okay. in the last 10, 15 minutes of the, of the talk and the okay. uh, presentation. So I think your presence to answer some of our queries will be better than trying to figure out what's wrong with the video. Um, yeah. so, 
what I was asking Dr. Sridhar and Dr. You can please complete the, your answer. Then I'll go back to Soibal and ask him the same question again. So no, you raised a very important question. You asked me whether we were able to actually stop the pharmacotherapy after initiating immunotherapy for a prescribed three to five years of treatment. I wish I could give an answer in affirmative, but unfortunately, no. But I can tell you, we were able to come down on the dosing of the medicine for sure. You know, if they were on high dose inhaled steroids, we were able to lower it a smaller dose. And we were able to uh, avoid many exacerbations, completely avoid hospitalization, and uh, improve the quality of life to the point that the patient does not feel insecure of being in a strange place because they feel that they have better control of the disease. So that kind of a assurance the patient gets a self-confidence builds up because they feel like they are not going to run into unexpected asthma flare-up or allergy flare-up when they are on immunotherapy. That kind of an improvement we have definitely seen, consistently seen, and I think we have seen it all the time. But hardly 5% of the patients we were able to actually stop the medicines. If we say that that will be a lie only, no. But significantly we were able to reduce the dose of the medicine that we are prescribing. And most of the patients are on very, very ordinary dose. We had patients on very, very high dose of steroids and they were on everything, like, you know, leukotriene inhibitors and they were antihistamines on everything. And then oral steroids for SOS needs. All these things have come down once we have started on immunotherapy. I think that's a really positive response. Your point is very well taken. And I think um, all of us would chime that and say that that's kind of the response. I have had better luck in some ways, if I may put it that way. I would say that I've had a good number of my uh, pediatric and adult patients come off medications during immunotherapy. And uh, the compliance, as you know, is the biggest issue. Many people drop off in the second year or the third year. Mm -hmm. But those who have completed it and done a good job and we've done the dose adjustments where necessary, they have come off medications. We had the hypoallergenic subcutaneous immunotherapy to house dust mite for a few years in India for about four years. And that therapy really helped me take some medic patients off medications. It was a very, very positive response. Uh, I had patients who nasal, nasal allergic patients who were requiring medications all the time and could not do without their uh, nasal steroids and their antihistamines, leukotrienes who literally went on an SOS or as needed basis with their medications. So, um, and, and even there is data from other parts of the world where uh, subcutaneous immunotherapy, especially with the hypoallergenic, what is called the allergoids, have led to up to 60% children come off their inhaled corticosteroids. Great. So, um, I think that the, the data is very encouraging. Dr. Soibal, can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah. Now I can hear. I don't know what was the problem. I was just getting disconnected from from this uh, podium. Okay, now now I can, I can hear. You. Now okay, I can okay. hear. You. So I think the question. Yes. So I think I missed the question. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. I'll I'll repeat it for you. So the question that I had yeah. asked Dr. Um, Sridharan was, what has been your experience with regards to doing immunotherapy for patients with either allergic rhinitis or allergic asthma or both? And what has been your experience with subcutaneous immunotherapy and sublingual immunotherapy if you do it? So your thoughts on that. I think we have lost Dr. Moitra again. When he joins back, I'm sure that we will uh, be able to ask him this question and get his insights on that. Um, like we said, having a disease modifying therapy in any disease, one that can alter the natural course of the disease. So we know that immunotherapy prevents new sensitizations. We know that immunotherapy prevents the progression from allergic rhinitis to asthma. We know that it prevents the progression from even in well-selected cases, atopic dermatitis to respiratory allergies in a well-selected and exclusively house dust mite allergic patients. So I think that uh, the disease modifying effect of immunotherapy, along with its long standing safety, it's been around for over 110 years in the injectable form and at least for 65 to 70 years in the sublingual form um, in modern medicine. In ancient medicine, it has been around for thousands of years, as I always say. 
um, so I think that it's it's very, very interesting. So Dr. Sridharan, when would you offer immunotherapy to a patient who you feel has a unified airway problem, one airway disease, upper and lower? Uh, are there some criteria or some features that you look for in the patient before you start immunotherapy? Well, if the total IG is very high, if the symptom score is high, if they're on high dose inhaled steroids and if they have flare up more than what we would like to consider as optimal, these are the conditions in which I would consider immunotherapy. And basically more than half my patients are very sick asthmatics. They're like moderately severe or severe asthmatics. I do both pediatric and adult asthma practice. And I see this more in children than in adults. The people, the patients who are kind of demanding very high dose uh, treatment for a proper control and who are having unexpected flare ups and uh, more frequent exacerbation than I would like to see. I like to see a patient with no exacerbations ideally, but any exacerbation that needing a hospitalization and if it happens, uh, more than a few times in a year, I would definitely consider immunotherapy. So I would think that more than 50% of my patients really need immunotherapy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mithi and Rishi uh, Soibal, Dr. Soibal was saying that he keeps getting bumped out of the system. Is there something that can be done so that the system does not disconnect him whenever he's connecting to the webinar? Is there something that the technical team can do, please? Uh, I think adding to what you said, Dr. Sridharan, I think even patients who are well controlled, but they don't want their child or as an adult don't want to be on medication for a prolonged period of time because they recognize that being on medications is the only way they can control their moderate disease or their severe disease or sometimes their mild disease may also be candidates for immunotherapy because uh, we are offering them something that is a steroid sparing therapy that is a medication sparing therapy. And uh, obviously it opens up a lot more for discussion, but I think at least in my practice, I get the question after a patient has been well controlled for six months or a year or two, sir, when can we stop these drugs? And the answer usually to them is you can't stop them because you already tapered them to the lowest dose possible. And if we have already had a discussion on immunotherapy with them before, we can very easily start them on it. Um, Dr. Moitra, are you there? Can you hear us? Or I guess he's having some technical issues. Um, not a problem. When he joins, we'll try to get his insights further. Um, I think the uh, one question that I had was, does allergen avoidance help manage allergic asthma better? I think you already covered that in your presentation. I think Dr. Soibal also mentioned it in his presentation. Uh, there is no doubt in our minds that after you have done allergy skin testing or blood testing, so not just random telling every asthmatic mm -hmm. put dust mite covers on your bed and mm -hmm. remove your pet from your home. All You cannot do empiric allergen avoidance. You have to do it in a directed way with the person's own testing. And I think that that can make a difference. Dr. Sridhar, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, very specific. I think, you know, there's nothing like a blanket advice for him. You avoid this food. You are, uh, I think this kind of a blanket uh, avoidance techniques is not going to work. You know, you have to do the testing and find out specifically what is going to be causing problems, and then you avoid that. You know, what one man's meat is another man's poison. So that kind of a blanket statement, whether it's food or any other, like pets or anything like that, that's not going to help. And and I think that's going to unnecessarily cause uh, inhibitions and barriers in somebody's life. You know. Somebody wants to have a dog and you just go and say, oh, you cannot have pets like that. And if you test, they're not allergic to dog. Why the hell you have to prevent, right? So I think, you know, so the, the freedom to live a happy, full life based on what we find after allergy testing should be scientific, sensible, and specific. Completely agree. Yeah. Dr. Soibal, I think we will be able to hear you now. You're back. I think he's just connecting to the <laughs> audio. Too bad. Uh, we are missing a very, a very senior person's uh, input in this. Huh? 
So I think he's now trying to connect through his iPhone. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sridharan, just a very interesting question that comes up often um, since we're talking about allergens, irritants, one airway, upper, lower, both getting affected, damage. We know air pollutants, indoor, outdoor, all impact uh, respiratory diseases and especially asthma and allergic rhinitis. Do you see any role for air purifiers um, in the management of allergic rhinitis and, and allergic asthma? Your thoughts on that? And, and I know that this is a very controversial topic and I'll also give my views on it yeah. uh, later, but I would love to hear what you have to say and you know, share with, your, with the audiences what they, will, what they can gain from your insights. Well, it also depends on where somebody lives, whether they are living in a very polluted you know, urban area, or they're living in a rural area away from the common pollution. But when it comes to air purifier, my understanding is, unless you're going to use HEPA filter as a device, as the main thing that's going to filter, the high efficiency particulate air filter, the regular filters are not going to be a lot of help for dust mite or most other uh, allergens. The, the particle size really makes a difference, right? So uh, if uh, um, vacuum cleaner or any other device or a central air conditioning, the air conditioning device, has got a HEPA filter in it, I like to promote that. If they don't have a HEPA filter, I don't promote that. I think uh, that's just a hype. I don't find it's going to be a lot of help. I don't know about uh, yours. My input is this. So I agree, you know, uh, a lot of people just assume that all air purifiers are created equal and unfortunately they are not. Yeah. Uh, air purifiers have quality, air purifiers have level of purification. Uh, there are ones with simple filters, there are carbon filters, there are HEPA filters, there's ultraviolet light for filtering. Uh, there are some uh, air purifiers that will have four or five mechanisms uh, in, in built into them and a lot of other bells and whistles. But we have to remember that allergens like house dust mite are very heavy allergens. They settle down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And an air purifier has to pull the air in and whatever is airborne, it has to be able to process that and, and put out clean air on the other side. So yeah. the, the more airborne light allergens like a cat dander or a dog dander or any of these allergens versus a house dust mite or a cockroach allergen, Sometimes you may not see the same effect. Now, there are some interesting air purifiers which put out certain what we call safe ions, not the negative ions that we know cause a lot of problem to asthmatics, but safe ions which can reach beyond where the air gets sucked into the air purifier. And I think that those may have a role uh, to play in some of these situations. And certainly people are welcome to connect with us. So I'm very selective. Like you said, I try to understand the patient's house the setup, mm. the exposures, uh, what their allergies are, what they're exposed to, what mm. I feel are their main triggers, and then decide if an air purifier might be of benefit for them. And obviously the cost factor, because a good air purifier would not cost anything below 15,000 rupees in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and many people feel that if they bought a cheaper one, just because they have it, it'll help. It may improve the air quality for certain aspects but for allergies, you need a bit more than just a regular air purifier, like you rightly said, with the HEPA filter, with other filters that are built in. So I think that's a very important point. We are mm -hmm. at 9 o'clock. We are at 9.01. And uh, we are just completing our webinar uh, today, this evening. So I want to thank you, Dr. Sridharan. I want to thank Dr. Soibal. I want to thank the Lupin team, Rishi, Dr. Mithi, uh, and the entire team at Lupin uh, for organizing this webinar as part of the World Allergy Week, which we recognize as such an important day because in India, it's estimated that anywhere between 15 to 25 crore people have some form of respiratory allergy. It's a very high number and the burden is huge. The impact on quality of life is huge. And the better we understand it and the better we choose medications and treat people, the better we will do in managing this chronic disease, uh, which uh, really changes a person's life in terms of sleep, activity, study, work, play, everything, and giving them the right diagnosis, the right allergen avoidance, the right pharmacotherapy, and eventually the right immunotherapy 
can make a world of difference to their life and let them live a complete life. And as the theme says, breathe better. Hitesh, Thank you very I much. Want, I want to add my gratitude to Lupins for bringing such a beautiful webinar. And uh, your input were great. I, I absolutely enjoyed interacting with you and listening to you. I just missed Saibal's uh, presence in the data portion. He was great and he was so comprehensive. I kind of sent into the inboxes even later. We will do our best to respond to them. And uh, we welcome everyone to connect with us uh, whenever possible in whatever forum possible, live or offline. And, um, you know, continue to enhance their knowledge about uh, allergies, about allergic airway diseases. There are many other allergic diseases. Obviously, we're talking largely airway today. And thank you very much and uh, good night to all. If Dr. Mithi wants to say any closing comments, uh, he's welcome to. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much and have a blessed night. Stay safe. Uh, COVID is back. So wear your masks, maintain your social distancing. Be careful. Make sure you've taken your vaccines and uh, boost your immunity. There you go, Dr. Sridharan. You got that right. So keep your immunity boosted with good diet, good lifestyle, exercise, good thoughts, positive thoughts, meditation, yoga, pranayam. These are all our gifts to the world. Please stick to them. They'll get us through whatever phase, phase four of COVID, if you may say, that we are in. Thank you and have a good night. I will add prayers to that. Thank you. <laughs> prayer, absolutely. Meditation is a form of prayer. So prayer included, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Recording stopped.